So, hello everyone. I'm Akira from Japan. Um, I'm presenting about something about Rails. I mean, this talk is about Rails performance, but I'm not going to talk about general application pro pro programming technique like eliminating M plus one or using Rails cache or things like that. Instead, I'm going to focus on how we can find real problems inside the framework and how we can approach them, right? So, the title says Rails Applications, but the main focus is not really on our application code, but more on Rails itself. So today, I brought some actual hacks that as Rails plugins, so I can share them with you and maybe you can check, check out later, right? So, I have a question. Is your application fast enough? Do you think so? My answer is no. For me, always, almost always no. So, it's like this. Oh. When we start the project, it's, it runs fast enough, but as the application grows, at some point it becomes really slow. I guess this applies to every one of you here, right? So, is that essentially because Ruby is slow? I think no. Ruby is actually already doing very well. Uh, I'm sorry, it's, it's like, <laughs> I should have made this, the slides more like downwards, I'm sorry. So, uh, the real problem, uh, <laughs> the real problem lies in the framework architecture, I think, and some very slow components of Rails. So here is, here's a diagram showing actual applications performance, not, not, not actually from my actual Rails application, but I'm sorry, I downloaded this image from Skylate's website without asking them. So, <laughs> I'll delete this if they don't like it. Anyway, uh, anyway, this diagram shows that it executes the query, the first query, and the second query, and the, the next query, uh, like in serial order, right? This means these are actually serially executed in the main thread. For example, while querying to the DB database, Ruby is just waiting, right? In other words, these are all blocking operation for the main thread. So, what if we can perform them without blocking the main thread? Like in parallel, or like in a non-blocking manner? So here's the menu of today's presentation. I have five topics. So, to begin with, uh, let's start my presentation with this simplest one. API calls. So, what I mean by API calls here is usually done by HTTP. Could be invoking some outside a API or like microservices. Um, so when you introduce microservices to your application, it would usually add some extra network overhead and make your application actually rather slower, right? So the, there's this real problem. Calling external API makes your application slow because it costs like HTTP uh, network cost, right? So this happens because the API call blocks the main thread while uh, requesting to another HTTP server. And the CPU does nothing while waiting for the response. So how can we make this non-blocking instead? So I brought some example. This example is a very simple example that 
the client makes three requests to a very heavy API, like it takes one second. The API looks like this, uh, just sleeps, sleeps one second. And here's the client code, just calls the API three times, right? So simple. So here is the result. Uh, it takes three, three minutes, I mean three seconds. So with this, I could kind of emulate the slow API problem, right? So, how can we fix this problem? It, it's a very simple Ruby code. Just wrap the API call with the thread new block, like this. And now it finishes in one second. Okay. So this is something called future pattern, kind of. Um, if you use, if you uh, query new new thread, it immediately starts running in background. Then if you call dot value on the thread object, it it. Uh, waits the thread to finish, then returns the uh, value back to the main thread, right? And you can do anything else in the main thread while the API is executing in the background. And usually we don't use the raw thread object, but use something uh, like this, uh, another object around the thread. So anyway, it's called the future pattern, right? So, with this basic idea in mind, let's proceed to the next topic. This is a very, very like simple example, right? To so push an I/O blocking task to a child thread and do something else in the main thread. Okay. So the next topic is boosting the database queries. Database queries are so time consuming, you know, which is obvious, right? So, and it's essentially just another kind of I.O. blocking task, right? So, while querying to the database, the main thread is just sleeping. So, you know, this is how Active Record handles database connections, basically. Basically, ActiveRecord checks out a connection from the pool per each thread, including main thread. So, one request uses only one connection, but actually the connection pool has many more pooled connections. And um, so we can probably use these like extra connections for other threads other than main thread. Okay. So here's there's this problem. Database query blocks the main thread and when you throw a query to the database you need to wait. Right. So and we already have a good solution for this problem. You know. Maybe we can apply the future pattern to this problem as well again. Now let me show you an example. Consider we have a very heavy query again like this. It's a very simple example. Well, when it selects a user, it sleeps just the same seconds as the user ID. So <laughs> it's, a very, it's a silly example, but <laughs> you know, the idea. So, Actually, it takes three seconds to select user one and user, user two, like this. And uh, using thread, we can do this in two seconds. Well, this is great. And so why doesn't Active Record act like this by default? 
um, because there are some problems with this approach. As I as I told you before, each thread automatically establishes a new connection, uh, grabs a new connection from the connection pool. Um, so if you if you establish too many new connections, um, the database pool will dry up very easily. So this is the problem. So we have active bracket. Active bracket actually has the with with connection API to use like this. Uh, use uh, whenever you run a query inside a child thread, just wrap them with the, this uh, connection pool dot with connection block. Right? So it automatically checks out the connection when thread is joining. So when we show the connection pool stat at the last line, it, show, it says that we have five connections in the connection pool and we used three connections for this operation. So I actually implemented something that does this for Active Record as an experimental plugin with these two APIs. First is Active Record Relation dot future. Oh, sorry, the highlighting is broken. Like uh, current user dot post dot future. If you if you call dot future method, then it starts querying in the back background. Then if you call dot value, um, sorry dot records, then it returns the the asynchronous query results. So it's already on the on GitHub. So the report the repository is here. It's named as future records, so you can check it out. It kind of works, but <laughs> it's actually, I don't think it's totally production ready. So, I mean, um, please be very, very, very careful if you actually try try it. Yeah. Um, maybe, maybe we need to add some, like, thread pool instead of... Um, Calling thread dot new every time. Um, I'm going to explain about what is thread pool later. By the way, there there could be several other approaches for this slow query problem. Um, first is share only one connection that that is used for main thread but pass the connection to other child threads. Or use a synchronous connection API. The first idea is sharing the main connection and pass the main connect pass the connection to the child thread and do something else in the main thread while the child thread is querying. Maybe we can use uh, fiber with, for this, but uh, I tried it but it was so difficult, so <laughs> I couldn't finish. Or another idea is, um, like, for some database adopters like MySQL 2 or Postgres, they have a synchronous query API. It goes like this. If you um, query through the synchronous mode, it immediately returns nil and runs the query in background and it returns the result. If the query is finished, um, you can get the result by a sync result method. So in order to use this in your application, you need to create a mechanism to detect the queries uh, exactly when the query is ended. So, 
I could kind of make this work locally, but it requires like super crazy hack on Active Record. Like, I needed to use uh, event machine, which is so complex. So, I don't really recommend you to try this, but if you want to try, there's an existing project called um, EM. EM synchron synchrony. Alright, so check it out. So anyway. Alright. So we're moving on to the, the views as the next topic. Next topic is action view. We often have very slow partial templates. And render render partial, of course, is again blocking the main thread. And in the most cases, partials do not share anything with other threads, I mean other partials. So maybe we can make this a current, maybe we can render this asynchronously. Maybe with Ajax? Maybe? So I did this. Here's my implementation. Add remote true option to render partial. Then it uh, throws the Ajax request and it kind of like renders back like Ajax, Ajax or like Bjax or something. And so this is actually I did this five years ago, and I realized this is a bad approach. So <laughs> I I created this, but I do not use this in production anymore. So instead, let's think about simply threading again, future pattern again. So here's the initial implementation of doing uh, action view render partial in the background. If you pass async option to the render method, it runs something, uh, it wraps the uh, render partial method with uh, future object, I mean future pattern object. So this, this is how it works. So let's try this. It's simply adding sleep one to each partial. Then let's see how it goes like this. Um, you see we have an action, A action, and A action renders B partial from A dot HMLRB, and each A, partial, uh, A view and B partial sleeps one second. And the result is, uh, sorry, I forgot to paste the result, but it kind of finishes in one second, right? And it returns a correct HTML, so it's done. I'm um, sorry, not not done. It it I'm sorry. It took two seconds actually. So we've got no no performance gain. Why? I used thread. So why didn't this become faster? So let's see what what's actually happening inside the framework. Well, action view compiles each template and partial templates to a Ruby method. Uh, so if you put some debugging code in action view, it outputs something like this um, in your console. And there in the middle, it calls render B. And it passes the result of render B to uh, output buffer dot append method like this okay and output buffer dot append is uh, is implemented like this so what I did was I created a future object by render async then immediately appends the future object to the buffer. And the buffer does this. 
it, it calls dot two s to the given object. So output buffer dot append um, render partial does it creates a future object then immediately calls to s to the partial object. So then it causes the background thread to join. But why does action view calls to s inside the bit buffer? Because out output buffer is a string and you need to you need to be you need to make sure that anything added to the string is is a string right or it would cause then some kind of unexpected behavior like if you you cannot append a symbol or if you append an integer it's going to be uh, like translated as a code point so you need to call to s before appending anything to a string So, how can you make the future object uh, live longer in the buffer, not not calling to S immediately? What if we store the view fragments in an array instead of string, then concat all of the fragments when returning um, HTML response body? The idea is like that, and here is the implementation. It's called array buffer. I overrided the concat method and stored the given fragment in its array. Then, if 2s is called, you can you just kind of join them all. So, so let's take a benchmark again. Uh, now, I did this actually, and now it returns the result in one second. When? Right. Uh, but please know that real real world templates usually do some more like CPU bound operation than just sleeping one second. So this is just a demonstration. Right. By the way, if you're looking for the fastest template engine in the world that is built on string-based string buffer. Uh, there's an implementation there's an implementation called string template. I'm sure it's the fastest. You can find it here on my GitHub page. It compiles the whole template in one very long string literal with string interpolations. So it creates only one string instance per one template. So it runs very fast, um, at least on some micro benchmarks. So anyway, <laughs> now let's see how the array-based array -based version of uh, buffer scales. Next, um, here's what is created by a rem, um, sorry, uh, generated scaffold, and first uh, extracts this like repetition part from the the index HTML to another template on impartial, like this, and I put something again sleep to sleep randomly in the partial, and. I registered 10 users with this scaffold and requested by a browser. And the result goes like this. Or sometimes it returns some weird error like this. A thread, thread something error. <laughs> so, what the hell is happening here? Of course, you know, it's called race condition. So why does this partial causes race condition? OK. 
can you find the answer? Because it shares something within threads. It shares an instance variable at sign output buffer between threads, right? So it causes race condition. So we need to change the buffer object to be a local variable or thread, local variable or something. So we need to monkey patch action view, right? So we need to monkey patch the template handler first. I'm not gonna paste the whole patch, but I've done this. Um, uh, I had to do so many of this, but it, I did, did this actually. So this is how we fix, kind of fix the a Ruby template handler. And let's do that. Do it again. Let's try rendering again. Actually, it uh, actually with this fix, uh, the the former example perfectly works. It it outputs the partials in correct order. So now, let's render something else. Uh, the next example is new.htmlrb rendering form partial from inside, right? Now let's try to render this with async option. So now it renders a broken HTML like this. So wh why this happens? This happens because of action views capture helper which uses, uh, which calls something called capture inside, and which uses the buffer, uh, which actually creates a new buffer and throws it away somehow. And uh, so you can get only the content inside the form for block without adding anything to the main block. So, I'm um, sorry. So, I fixed it this somehow. I, I, I kind of <laughs> made a horrible hack on action view, then I kind of emulated this with only with uh, local variables. So with this patch, um, we can run so many, as many threads as possible at once. But if you run hundreds or thousands of threads, actually the response time goes bad because, um, you know, threads is costly and, I mean, switching between threads takes some time for Ruby. So, so in order to make it faster, we need to control the number of running threads or like number of established threads. In order to do this, we'll introduce a, something called thread pool. Okay. So, of course, we could create our own thread pool in implementation but actually Rails ships already ships with uh, this implementation inside concurrent Ruby gem. So we just can use this. So with this thread pool, I finally kind of finished implementing an async partial renderer. But <laughs> we still have to monkey patch all these other template engines like Slim, Ruby, Hamel, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and especially monkey patching Hamel is is uh, so horrible. I mean, I probably should not shouldn't say this, but as a maintainer of a main maintainer of Hamel pen template engine, but but Hamel code base is just horrible. So. <laughs> 
I couldn't finish monkey patching Hamel <laughs> until today. So uh, I'm sorry, this this gem is not actually finished. So anyway, the code is placed here again on my GitHub page, so you can check out. Oh, and this there. Are, I talked about all these template engines rendering HTML file, but what about JSON renderers? We have this def default JSON renderer called JBuilder. Um, but unfortunately, it's completely not working because it's another horrible template engine. So, <laughs> but I suppose you're not using JBuilder anymore because we have a better alternative to JBuilder called JB. JB, of course, works perfectly with my uh, asynchronous renderer. I mean, array buffer, because it's implemented in very good manner. So check out the JBuilder template engine. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, JB. JB is, you can find JB here. Right. So anyway, uh, uh, let's start moving on to the next topic, lazy attributes. So let's move on to the view code inside, inside the view code and find what's slow there. Right. I'm creating another example, another realistic example like this. Um, scaffolding 100 columns, <laughs> and I created 1,000 records for 100 columns. So obviously, very much real world-ish, right? So, so we can run this via like this curl, and I run five times. I run this five times and we get results like this. It it takes around one one point six or one point seven seconds for each uh, request. And you see mostly in views, right? So let's see what's happening in views. So what if we change the attribute accessors to literals, to string literals like this, just like quoting. So the re result goes like this. The score improves to be about 800 milliseconds. This means uh, half of the response time was spent on just reading from already selected active record instance, right? So it should be as just a method call. Why does it cost this that much? So I counted the number of method calls when calling the, the attribute accessor. Then it turned out that only one method call cost, uh, actually calls 13 method methods inside one attribute access. Right? And if I call a date time, time stand attribute, it makes 30 method calls inside the framework. So looping 1,000 uh, 1, records and accessing 100 columns, it, it kind of makes this much method calls? Yes, it does. So this is why active records is slow. Right? <laughs> because it's because the framework is written to be slow. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, of course, you're not doing this in your real world application. You're, you're going to use pagination with something like this. <laughs> um, but anyway, um, there are actually there are some use cases in real world applications, like APIs or like fintech application or something like that. Actually, in fact, we hit this real problem in our 
application called money forward, we had to render uh, this much models, and it took like 10 seconds, really. So, in my opinion, active record model is designed to do too much work. It's too rich object. Actually, it implements two different roles in one model class. One is data transfer object, and one is uh, to be a form object, right? The first former is, uh, can be read only, and the latter can, has to be a read and write object. So you need to like do validations and type casting and like et cetera, et cetera. So, and what we need in this scenario, just reading is, what we need is more like lightweight read only object like a uh, data trans transfer object in like something like uh, entity B in Java or something, right? So um, you can create something like that with simple, simply with Ruby struct or something, but you, Probably you you're not, you don't want to do that because it's not going to play play nice with decorators. Decorators, I mean, with this this plugin. So instead, why don't we just store the attributes as a hash instance inside the model object, like Active Record used to be like that. So let's try this to solve this real problem not by adding more complexity, but retrieving back the simplicity of active record two or three. Um, again, we need to monkey patch active record. Because recent version of active record implements the attribute API. It's, it's a very good feature indeed, but it's so heavy actually. Um, to be fair, we actually use this feature in Money Forward for some columns, but I think it's very rare case, I think. So, oh, so inside the attribute API, it, it creates each column object per each um, active record model instance. That is why it's so heavy. So why don't we opt out this, this attribute API feature? Like um, not, not, create, not to create column objects by default, but only for these users who actually use this, this uh, attribute feature. So here's my implementation. If the model declares no custom attribute uh, declaration. It returns uh, like active record three like object. Right. So here's the implementation. Um, first, I made a simple attribute set object that delegates to a hash object. Then attribute set builder object that builds a, uh, that lightweight attribute set object then override attributes builder to return the lightweight attribute builder object if the model has no custom attribute. And here's the result. Again, it, it used to take 1.6 or 1.7 seconds for each request, and now the result improves like this. Then it improves like 40% 40 past, 40 faster. Um, so, I'm sorry, it's still not production ready. I, I, I need to implement some like some kind of a typecasting when reading, but I'm sure it, it would still be faster than the default active record ob ob object. Um, I'm gonna skip this. Um, uh, again, I have one more thing to cover, the named URL. Now, 
now the model is fast enough, then what's slow next? The answer is links, these links. If we just uh, delete these links, the result goes from this like to this. It improves like 35%. Um, so the problem we found is that named URL is slow. And the solution for fixing this is already here. I mean, if the buffer is array-based, you can just make the link to call to be a, feature ob a future object. So it's kind of done. <laughs> and Or another solution is that maybe we can cache the results in memory using uh, Rails cache or something. I actually created this three, two years ago, so check this out. So, uh, conclusion. Sorry for the overtime. So, I'm going to close my talk with revising what we learned today. First, we learned uh, we have so many slow things in the applications, and maybe we can solve them, some of them, with Ruby threads, maybe. And you can find what's slow in your application, and you can fix it. If the problem lies in the framework, uh, go ahead, hack the framework. Um, next, to investigate the performance problem in the framework, uh, perhaps you need to do a lot of monkey patching. Uh, good luck. Um, next, and what I learned through programming, uh, like preparing this talk, is that thread programming is very hard. I don't want to do that anymore. <laughs> so, uh, so future plans. I I'm gonna finish implementing these plugins, and um, I'd like to put them in actual production applications. Um, and probably I want to like improve Rails to accept more of these kind of monkey patches. I mean, patches or monkey patches. Um, um, that's it. Um, so have fun with hacking for the performance. That's all. Thank you. Thank you.